Okay, so today we're just going to do some really quick review of electricity section 2.0 and 3.0. Let's get going. Uh, so the concepts we're going to run through today are just the ones we've been covering the last few uh, weeks here. Uh, we're going to talk about circuit diagrams, we're going to talk about electromagnets, we're going to talk about motors, generators, power, and efficiency. It sounds like a lot of different concepts, um, but especially those last five concepts are all really intertwined uh, and they'll all connect together quite well. Now I know uh, we've done circuit diagrams for quite a while now, uh, and I know on the last uh, quiz that I posted on, on Google Classroom uh, that you were also assessed on how to do those, uh, but I just wanna revisit them one more time uh, because our next uh, Google Classroom quiz is actually one that isn't on Google Form, so it's not multiple choice. It's one that you actually have to do on pen and paper. So I do wanna see that we can do these circuit diagrams one more time because that is a really big, important outcome uh, for this unit. Anyway, let's get going. So circuit diagrams, uh, from our assignment, which I've already had a look at, uh, I noticed a few common errors, nothing that was too significant by any means. Uh, a lot of people were really creative with their assignments, uh, but I just did notice some things that went, okay, that, that doesn't quite work. Uh, one thing I wanna say is be sure to avoid creating any short circuits. Now a short circuit is just basically where electricity can bypass the load altogether and return directly back to the battery. Basically how electricity wants to flow is it wants to flow in the path, in the path of least resistance. What that means is if it doesn't have to go through any lamps or any motors, it won't, right? So it doesn't want to do that. Uh, so just be careful for that because if you have a short circuit, uh, your, your loads are just not going to work. Or, or at least if they do, there might be some problems with them. Uh, now another thing I noticed uh, is loads organized in parallel circuits should be in their own parallel lines. There were a few people that of course uh, tried to make a parallel circuit, but then I noticed there was like loads that were in more than one parallel uh, or like in other words, they're directly chained in a line together. Uh, and that's not going to work either because again, the project was asking us uh, to make sure that every single load was in its own parallel so that they could be turned off separately. Uh, now, another thing I wanna mention is imagine if your switch was opened in just one of your parallels, would electricity still be able to make it to the battery? Uh, so in other words, what I'm trying to say by that is, let's say if we looked at this parallel circuit in this picture right here. Now there aren't any switches drawn in here, but what if I drew a switch let's say right here. Now, if I open this switch, electricity coming out of the negative end and into the positive end, electricity is not gonna be able to go through this parallel, so this lamp is not gonna work. Uh, but notice it can still go this way, go through this lamp, so this lamp will still be on, uh, and then it'll make its way back to the positive end over here. So putting a switch in this parallel right here is actually just fine, uh, because all that switch is gonna do is control this lamp. Uh, and regardless of whether the switch is open, in other words, like the chain here is broken, or if the switch is closed, uh, in other words, electricity can flow through, uh, electricity will still also flow through this lamp. It'll just kind of like break into two paths here, like imagine like water flowing. Uh, if you created a new path for the water to flow, it's gonna flow here, and it's also gonna continue flowing here, right? Uh, so this is just fine. If I threw another switch in right here, uh, then we have a similar uh, thing that could happen. Uh, if both of these switches are open, then the whole circuit is done. There's no electricity that's gonna flow altogether because there's gonna be no way for electricity to come back to the positive end of the battery. Uh, but let's say this switch was open and this switch was closed. So in other words, it's just totally fine. Well, if this switch is open, of course, electricity is not gonna be able to go through this parallel, uh, but it still will be able to go through this one, okay? Uh, so again, just try to imagine the way that the electricity is gonna go. And remember, electricity flows from a negative end to a positive end. Uh, so just try to, try to make sure that you can follow a path uh, and actually get it back to the positive end so the circuit is actually complete. Uh, one other thing I'll say about that, just back to the short circuit thing I was mentioning, uh, I don't wanna spend too much longer on this, but a short circuit, of course, like I said, is where electricity can bypass the load. Let's look at a series one, for instance. This series one is awesome, it's very basic. You, you just got your series circuit with both the lamps. If one of these lamps went out, both lamps would go out because the circuit would be broken. Um, but also just keep in mind, if we drew a new wire that just went from here to here, uh, without there actually being any useful load, you might actually end up creating yourself a short circuit. Because why on earth would electricity, when it's flowing through here, why on earth would it go this way and have to pass through these lamps when it could just go this way and complete a short circuit? In other words, it wouldn't have to pass through these lamps, it wouldn't have to convert any energy. Uh, it's way easier for it just to loop through this way. Uh, so that would be uh, an example of a short circuit. Uh, and keep in mind, What's different between just drawing a line here and drawing a line with a load is in this case, of course, there's still a load for it to pass through. So it doesn't matter if it goes this way or if it goes this way, it still has the same amount of work to do. I'm oversimplifying it, but that's just generally the, the basic idea. Anyway, we'll move on. 
Uh, draw a parallel circuit containing a three cell battery, two light bulbs, one motor, three switches that control only one load each, uh, and a fuse that if destroyed would shut off the entire circuit. Uh, if you wanna try this, uh, be my guest by all means, you can pause the video right here, but I'm gonna go over it one way or another. Uh, I'll show you kind of what my strategy would be on making these. Now we know it's a parallel circuit that actually makes things pretty convenient here so we can draw a bunch of different parallels. What I always do though is I start with my battery. It's a three cell battery so I'll do my negative, positive, there's one cell, negative, positive, there's another cell, negative, positive, there's another cell. And then of course you just connect it with some wires. So now it's starting to form a circuit. Uh, now we want two light bulbs and one motor uh, so that the three switches that control them only control one load each. What that kind of is indicating to us is we should put each of the light bulbs and the motor in their own separate parallels. So if I start drawing this, uh, and again, I can erase some segments as I go. Um, if I start drawing this, let's say we'll make one parallel here. Well, you know what, I should be a little more careful with this. One parallel here, there we go. And then maybe if I make another parallel here, and then maybe if I make another parallel right here, this is gonna be a little bit weird doing on that on the PowerPoint here, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. Okay, so we want to have the light bulbs and the motors in their own loads. So I'm gonna look, or sorry, in their own parallels. So let's uh, let's draw these in their own parallels. I'll put the light bulbs in these ones and I'll put the motor in this one. So I gotta fix this now. I'll put a light bulb in this one. So let's draw this. And then a light bulb is just a circle with like a loop-de-loop -loop in the middle here. Uh, and then finish it off, good. So there's one light bulb. Let's do another light bulb. Again, circle with a loop-de-loop -loop kind of in there and there. Uh, and then the last one is the motor. I'll do it in this one. A motor is a circle with about three dots going through it, kind of like that. Awesome. All right, so we have our three cell battery, we have our light bulb, we have our motor. Uh, the one thing that we're forgetting is of course our switches. Uh, now we want our switches drawn in such a way that they control only one load each, right? Now how this is gonna work is you should put your switch in the same parallel that your load that you wanna control is. What I saw uh, during the assignment was I'd see people who put like a switch over here, for instance. We'll put it this way. If we put a switch right here, there's a switch. If we put a switch right there, if this switch is open, there is absolutely no way for the electricity to come from the negative end and make it back to the positive end. It's broken right here. So that switch where it's located, where I've just drawn it right here, would actually shut off everything in the whole circuit because nothing is going to flow. Uh, so this is not going to be a very good location for our switch in this case. So I'm going to redraw the line there. Uh, instead, draw your switches in the own like in their own parallels with these other guys, right? So how about I just draw them on the top part of each parallel? It doesn't really matter whether it's the top or the bottom because electricity would be broken one way or another. So there's a switch. There's another switch. And ooh, these are getting worse as they go. And there's another switch. There we go. Awesome. Uh, so think about it this way. If this switch is open right here, electricity is not going to be able to pass through this branch. But if these ones were closed, electricity would still be able to find its way through. So there, there's nothing wrong with doing a switch within their own parallels. We're good to go on that one. So in other words, we've got those three switches. One last thing we've got to draw in here is a fuse. Uh, we want this fuse drawn in such a way that if it gets destroyed, and remember fuses get destroyed if there's pretty much too much current going through it, uh, that would shut off the entire circuit. So it would safeguard the rest of these. Uh, a fuse that's going to shut everything off should be located closer to the battery. So in other words, it would break the entire chain. I can draw it over here. I can draw it over here. It doesn't actually matter whether I draw it close to the positive or the negative end. Um, just as long as it's closer to the battery so that that is going to completely prevent electricity from either coming out of the battery or coming back into the battery. So how about I just draw it? I'll draw it just down here. Uh, a fuse is kind of a fun one to draw. It's kind of like a switch where you draw like the two little lines here, but then it's like a big squiggle right? That right there would be a fuse. Anyway, I think we've kind of beat these to death, but just keep in mind on that quiz, there is going to be a circuit diagram that you will be expected to draw. All right, next thing, electromagnets. Here's, there's gonna be a little new piece of information here. I think you guys will like this. So uh, just a, a reminder what an electromagnet is. If you have a current carrying wire and it's bent into a coil, like you coil it up uh, and you run a current through it, of course, that's going to form an electromagnet. So in other words, that coil of wire, like you see in this picture here, this coil of wire is actually going to behave as a magnet. It's going to have a north end and a south end as long as it's in a coil and as long as electricity is flowing through it. Uh, now here's something kind of interesting. You don't really need to know this for this course. It's just kind of an FYI. Uh, when you get into physics 30, actually, grade 12 physics, uh, you will actually need to use this. So you're learning something early. Uh, if you use your left hand, okay, so if you take your left hand and you curl your fingers 
It's going to help you predict the way that the magnet, the electromagnet, I should say, will behave. So how it works is just curl your fingers on your left hand in the direction that your electricity is going to flow. So notice in this picture, the wires are curling over this bar and under. And the arrows are kind of showing that's the way our electrons are flowing. So our negative flow is going this way. Uh, so since our negative flow is going this way, you can curl your fingers over and then point your thumb out just kind of perpendicular to the rest of your hand. Your thumb is actually going to point in the direction that your north end of your magnet is going to be. And then like the, the back end of your hand or whatever is going to be where the south end of the magnet is going to be. Uh, so this is kind of a cool way of just predicting how an electromagnet is going to function. Uh, now, just keep in mind, uh, I know in, in certain circumstances, uh, including actually electricians themselves, they don't actually consider electricity flow to be the electrons moving, uh, even though that is, in terms of scientific terms, the actual way elect uh, electricity is flowing. Uh, but for whatever reason, uh, electricians will often think of positive flow. I'll just write that out here, positive flow. So they imagine as if it's the positive particles moving through a wire. Now we know that's not the case, but that's just how things were set up uh, when electrician work started becoming a thing. Uh, but the good news is these hand rules can work if you think of positive flow as well. So if you were thinking of positive flow, you would think that uh, the, the, the positive parts are actually going uh, outwards, right? So your, your fingers would have to uh, curl the other way. Uh, but if you use your left hand, you'd see that your thumb would therefore point this way when your, your fingers are pointing out of the page. So imagine like your thumbs are curling this way out of the page, uh, your thumb would be pointed this way. Well, here's the thing. Electricians, when they think of positive flow, they'll actually use their right hand instead. So if you try it right now, if you just hold your right hand out with your fingers curling towards you, so like imagine you're using your right hand to like look at your fingernails with your fingers cur uh, curled, uh, your thumb would still point out the other way, so your thumb would still point the north end of the magnet. Uh, so it all depends on perspective. Again, in science, we consider it uh, that the electrons are flowing because like i'm sorry to electricians the electricians that is actually what's happening uh, but electricians often consider positive flow uh, just because that was the standard that was set up many many years ago right And there's nothing wrong with that as long as you keep uh, keep yourself consistent uh, electricians obviously know exactly what they're doing but uh, just in terms of science so let's think of the electrons moving anyway moving on all right, motors and generators, I'm not going to beat this to death, but you do need to have an understanding of how they work. I've included it just in one slide because motors and generators work on the exact same setup and the exact same principle. Basically, how it works is that you have a positive end and a negative end. This is on a motor, we'll say. Uh, you have a positive and a negative end hooked up to what we call little brushes, right? Brushes are just going to barely skim the surface of this commutator here, often called a split ring commutator. Now, it's called a split ring commutator, of course, because there's splits in the ring itself. And this ring is connected to like a little fly swatter shaped loop of wire. So think of it this way. This negative end is touching the split ring commutator here. Now you notice the arrows here. The arrows are like, this is clearly a, a diagram made by electricians because the arrows are pointing the way that the positive flow would go. In terms, of, uh, in terms of science though, we know it's electricity moving in terms of electrons, so it's negative flow. So the electrons are going through this way. Uh, and what's gonna happen is the, there's gonna be a force cause by this presence of a magnetic field. Because remember, when electricity flows through a straight wire, it produces cur a curling um, magnetic field around that wire. So there's gonna be a force, basically it's gonna be repelled from this north magnet, it's gonna be attracted towards the south magnet, so it's gonna be lifting up. This is going to spin this way, clockwise I guess we can say, uh, and as it spins, eventually you get to a point where you hit this split right here. And when it hits the split, the brushes are no longer making contact, so no electricity is flowing. But there's enough momentum in this that it's gonna spin a little bit more and then eventually this piece is gonna be hooked up to the negative end. So electricity will still be flowing that way except through this arm uh, of the motor. So this cycle is just gonna continue and continue and continue. So this whole coil of wire is just gonna end up spinning repeatedly. That's how a motor works. It's just a coil of wire between two magnets that's got some electricity going through it which creates a magnetic field and causes this thing to spin. All motors, like you think of an electric fan for instance, all motors are just something spinning. That's all how it works, right? Now, in terms of how this relates to a generator, a generator is the exact same thing, except you didn't have it hooked up to uh, like some sort of power supply. You are manually cranking this, which is producing electricity flowing through it. So it's kind of like forcing electricity to get pushed through it. So it generates electricity that way. Kind of cool. All right, power. Uh, we're gonna whip through this. Uh, so power can be cal calculated in one of two ways. P equals IV, so in other words, power is your current times your voltage, uh, or you can say power is equal to energy divided by time. This formula is way nicer, way easier to think this way. 
but just keep in mind this formula comes around every now and then, so be prepared to use it. My advice to you, if you haven't already made yourself a cheat sheet of some sort, definitely write down a cheat sheet, uh, put both of these formulas on it, because you will need to be using them, of course, on that quiz. Uh, now the unit for power is watts. Never forget to uh, list your units, of course. Uh, watts is just a measure of how many joules of energy are used per second. So a watt is really a joule per second. Okay, that's basically what a watt is. All right, so for example, how many joules of energy are used if a 100 watt light bulb runs for two minutes? Okay, so let's break this down. We know our power is 100 watts. We know our time is two minutes. Minutes are not a very good unit of time though. We wanna turn it into seconds. Two minutes times 60 seconds per minute tells you two minutes is 120 seconds. So 120 seconds is our time. Power is just energy over time. We're looking for energy, so we can say 100 watts is equal to some amount of energy divided by our time, which is 120 seconds. Just take a little bit of math to uh, figure out E here now. Uh, because it's E divided by 120 and we wanna get E by itself, we gotta do the opposite of divide by 120. The opposite of divide is times, so we gotta times by 120 on both sides. Long story short, you're gonna have 100 times 120, that's gonna be 12,000. And the units on energy, of course, are joules. Never forget your energy, or I mean, never forget your units. You need to have units on all the things that you calculate. Anyway, next question. Uh, oh, okay, right to efficiency, I see. All right, so basically efficiency is the useful output energy divided by the total input energy expressed as a percentage. So here's another example. Let's suppose we had an electric fan and it's consuming 70 watts of power, okay? The actual mechanical energy produced by the fan in one second is 50 joules. Find the efficiency to the nearest tenth of a percent. Okay, so here's how we're gonna break this one down. First of all, I gave you power and I gave you energy, okay? We're looking for efficiency, however. Efficiency is useful output energy, so what's actually being used, like output, right? What are you actually generating here? Divided by your total input energy. Now this whole point about, about it being in one second is actually quite important. Remember what watts mean. Watts is just a unit of measure for joules per second. So when you have an electric fan that's consuming 70 watts of power, that means it's consuming 70 joules per second, okay? Now we know the actual mechanical energy, so the useful, the useful amount here is actually only 50 joules in one second. So we can say that our efficiency is our useful, which is 50 joules, divided by our input energy. Now our time here is just one second, so 70 watts, if you times that by one second, it's gonna tell you that you used in one second 70 joules. Uh, now of course, efficiency needs to be times by 100 because that's gonna turn it into a percentage. Let me just calculate this real quick. 50 divided by 70 gives you, to the nearest tenth, 71.4%. So there you go, that electric fan is 71.4% efficient. Kinda cool. All right, we're done. That took a little longer than I was hoping today, I apologize, but make sure you complete all practice questions. We were only 18 minutes today, so you have to, uh, another 12 minutes, of course, because 30 minutes per day. Uh, you got another 12 minutes to polish those off if you haven't already. If you have already polished them off, good for you. That was what you were supposed to do in the first place. You got no additional work today, so you're good to go. Uh, now, the quiz will be a bit different than previous quizzes. You're going to need to do it on a piece of loose leaf uh, or print it off if you can. You don't have to print it off. Uh, if you don't have a printer at home, of course, that, that means you can't print it off, so don't worry about it. Uh, but just make sure you write your answers down on a piece of loose leaf. Make it very clear. Take a very clear photo or scan if you have a scanner at home. Uh, and then submit your answers, of course, on Google Classroom. The reason I'm doing it this way this time is I actually want to see some written work from you. Uh, I think a multiple choice test is something that you can kind of, uh, you know, quickly rush your way through. And I don't want that anymore. So I'm holding you guys accountable to uh, a bit of a longer assessment here deal with it. Anyway, so uh, if you need any help, please uh, let me know, reach out, send me an email, whatever you need. Best of luck.